We are finally finishing up our tour of five great reptile pets from every continent around the world. Last one, we're finishing up with one that a lot of people asked for throughout the entire series that I, we all knew I was going to get to eventually, but we are finally covering South American pet reptiles. So, again, just to reiterate on everything, these are not necessarily the best pet reptiles. They are just reptile species that I know do make very good reptile pets. There may be some that you may not have heard of, which is why I was going for those over some others, as well as maybe even one that will be a little bit controversial, so you gotta hear me out before you, you know, you, you crucify me a little bit about it. So, without further ado, let's get into it. And the first one is one that's been in the hobby for a very long time, but it really kind of fell out of focus and popularity come like the influx of a lot of other different species, and that is the amoeba. So the amoeba is actually part of a larger species or clad called amoeba that make up their range from uh, southern Central America all the way into South America and then even into a couple of the Caribbean islands. There are quite a few different species of the genus amoeba, but we're going to talk specifically about the amoeba amoeba or the giant amoeba or the green amoeba. And I don't know how many times I'm going to say that in these 30 seconds of just amoeba amoeba amoeba. Sorry about that. These guys are a really cool species of lizard. They're not very large. These ones typically hit between 18 to 22 inches long. So not huge, and that's nose to tail. So that's a smaller lizard, so we're not talking about like a tegu or anything like that as far as size goes. These guys are really, really cool. When you look at their basic body structure, they look actually very similar to like a really big anole. But they're, for a long time, they were actually considered part of the family that made up anoles as well. But since then, they've been you know, taxonomically, taxonomically separated about that. They're really, really brightly colored lizards. So just like a lot of species of reptiles, they, go, they do go through a small oxygen egg change, not nearly as dramatic as that, say, of like a green tree python or an emerald tree bow, but when they're younger, they kind of have this really cool green striped black brown coloration. And as they get older, and specifically the males, get much brighter green, and then they go to a really cool dark mottled color. And then the females also get that, just not quite as vibrant. When you were to, if you were to go out and go looking for these guys out in the wild, you would find them in a wide variety of habitats. They can be found on plains and savannas. They can be found in the tropical rainforest. They can be found under leaf foliage on the ground. They can be found in trees and in larger shrubs. They can be found near human habitations. They're very adaptable. Again, we think about the kind of like similarities to say in a knoll, which they look very similar to that too. They are insectivores. And they, so when we start thinking about keeping them in captivity and we think about their requirements, so we got to think about that area, just like South America, this is one of the more hot rainfall, or not necessarily the hottest rainforest, that's probably Africa and like the Congo, places like that. So this is a very humid one where the temperature doesn't fluctuate a whole lot. So we have to think this is going to be a high humidity, constant heat, not crazy fluctuations between day and night. And then insectivores, you need a wide variety of prey diets. So different crickets, doobie roaches, mealworms, superworms, hornworms, everything like that, with the calcium and vitamin powders dusted and supplemented and added to their diets. They are semi-arboreal. Like I said, they can be found in trees and in bushes and things. So give them a little bit of vertical room to climb on as well as larger things like half logs and cork tubes for them to climb in and under, give them some subspray to bury under. Just a really, really cool species of lizard that a lot of times when you get them in, ca in captivity, that a lot of them are still wild caught. So they're very skittish at first, but once they do settle down, they will actively start to acclimate to their environment, to your presence. And even there's a lot of interactions you can get with a lot of other species lizards very similarly to where they're feeding off of tongs and coming up to greet you because they're expecting food and interaction. So just a really cool species of lizard. And then that is essentially my token lizard for the video. And we're gonna get back to really what more and more people expect of me to talk about. And that is the snakes. And this next one is probably the one that a lot of people saw coming. So we all knew this one was coming, right? So this is the boa constrictor. This is Cupcake. She is our large female Guyana boa. And so whenever I end up talking about boa constrictors, it doesn't matter what capacity I'm talking about them, people always get mad at me. And that is mainly for classification and taxonomy reasons. So when we think about boa constrictors, we're usually thinking about one of two animals, the imperators or the constrictors. The imperators are mainly found in Central America. They were part of the Central American pre reptile video. They're the ones that have most of the morphs, things like that. 
The true constrictors that we like to call, the true red tail constrictors are the boa constrictors. And in the boa constrictor, there are quite a few different subspecies as well as uh, localities and bloodlines. And that's where we end up running into a lot of trouble between whichever scientist and biologist you happen to be arguing with at the time, which are true subspecies, which are now part of imperators, which are, you know, whatever. So I'm gonna to stick to essentially talking mainly about the for sure constrictor subspecies and talking about them. So these guys can be very variable. They're mostly, they're found essentially all throughout South America from Colombia and Venezuela, all the way down to Argentina and Paraguay. As I said before, there are quite a few different subspecies, which can vary them a little bit, but overall their temperament and requirements are fairly similar and there can be a little fluctuation and I'm gonna get a little bit into that. So for instance, this girl, the Guyana, this is one of the ones that we truly think about as being one of the true red-tailed boas. They're found in the country of Guyana as well as Suriname. Um, and, I, and this is another thing that's gonna get me yelled at. So when we think about the different localities, there's the Guyana, these are the constrictor constrictors, the Guyana, the Suriname, the North Brazilian, things like that. But they're all the boa constrictor constrictor that are found and came from different places. And actually they went and did a little bit more research and they found that other than select few animals, the Guyanas and Surinams are basically the same animals, even to the point where they were coming from the same like collection farm and, uh, and the captive hatch farm and just being sold and labeled differently. But in addition to the constrictor constrictors, so the Guyanas, the Surinams, there are the Peruvians, which those are the ones that have typically the reddest of tails. So we look at her tail, it's a little bit more brown, um, but typically the, what are you doing, silly? But typically the Peruvians are the ones that historically have the really red tails, the ones that are sometimes even considered a little bit longer. Um, they are very similar, but a little bit different. They're really cool. We don't have any Peruvians here. Then there are other different subspecies um, that range in size and things like that. So that say for instance, there are the Longicatas, the long tail boas. Those are ones that are almost a dwarf boa. They typically never exceed six feet long. They're a little bit darker in coloration. They're usually still fairly mellow. Um, these girls and boys, they typically hit seven to 10 feet. Um, very similar to that of the boa imperators usually a little bit larger on average, but they can and have exceeded lengths of over 12 and 13 feet. There's the Bolivian silverback boa, which or the short tail boa, which are a little bit more shiny gray black in coloration. They have shorter tails, which means they're probably not as arboreal. Um, they're a little bit smaller as well. Then there's, there's the Argentinian boas, which those are the ones that exceed at the very southern, 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 southmost part of the boa constrictor range. They like a little bit cooler temperatures because they're a bit further away from the equator. They are darker in coloration, and that's something that we see in a lot of species of animals. The farther away from the equator, the less sun there is, and usually the darker the appearance of the animal to allow for more heat and UV absorption. They are historically and typically considered the longest species of them on average, with females almost always averaging eight plus feet. They're very heavy bodied, very large animal, and we have one little baby boy uh, boa, uh, true Argentinian boa that at some point I will do a whole video about several of the different subspecies giving each of them their own video. But overall, these ones make amazing pet animals. Um, you know, typically the only thing that I will say about boa constrictors as something of a cautionary tarot, something to keep in mind, obviously these are very, very large animals. So that means you need very large enclosures, which means six feet is a minimum for a large constrictor snake, such as a boa constrictor, for an adult female like this, or even males, six feet is a minimum. They will still climb, obviously, as she's moving around on me. They have much, much slower metabolisms. They can be incredibly long-lived, great pet animals, but you have to remember, you can't keep them super hot. You gotta keep them nice and humid. You can't feed them all the time and give them space and time to grow. So, taking a break from that workout, we're gonna talk about a species of snake that's a little bit smaller, a little bit easier to handle without breaking a sweat on it. So this is actually not the species of snake we're talking about, but it's a pretty good visual representation. So the one on the list that we're actually gonna be discussing is the Andean milk snake. This is a little Puebloan milk snake, so a little bit different, and we're gonna talk about why. So milk snakes are part of that big genus that comprise of both king snakes and milk snakes called Lampropeltis. In Latin, it's the shield belly, which you can't really see on him, but it's really shiny, big belly scales. 
They have a huge range and consists well over 20 different species and even more subspecies. They range from Canada all the way down to Ecuador. And the Andean milk snake specifically only lives in the Andean mountain range of Peru and Ecuador. They are one of the largest species of milk snake. In fact, they are number two, barely making it out under the black milk snake being the largest, which means that even though I've talked about the Honduran being very large, on average, the Andean milk snakes are larger. And there's probably a reason for that. A lot of the animals that end up living at higher up in altitude end up being larger because then they have the ability to eat larger prey and hold on to that food and being able to process and metabolize it slower so that way they don't have to be as active during the colder weather months. And so when I say that, we're still thinking about South America, right? We're still thinking that it's gonna be fairly warm and stuff like that. Well, it's true, but Andean milk snakes have been found at a height of elevation of over 9,000 feet. So that's 4,000 feet higher than Denver. So when people from Florida go to Denver and they lose their breath just walking off the airport, even higher. That's where people go to train to be in Olympics and do any like world, you know, world football and things like that. They go to train down there. Their athletes have greater lung capacities because there's limited air and they're closer to the sun and it's a little bit cooler so they can go farther faster. Anyway, the Andean milk snake does share a lot of the same attributes as most of the other milk snake species. They have that tricolor red yellow back coloration, you know, that acts as a mimicry for coral snakes. Although with the Andean milk snake specifically, as well as, you know, obviously the black milk snake is a much more uh, dramatic example of it. When they are born, they are much more dynamic, this very clear distinction of the three different colored triads. And as they get older, the black tends to actually kind of bleed into the reds and the yellows a little bit more. Not so much as the black milk snake, as I said before, that's entirely black or almost entirely black. They do get a little bit more muddled and almost dull looking. But again, that also probably has to do with the fact that they uh, are a little bit colder. Even though they're closer to the sun, it's not as long, it's a little bit cooler. So they use that black coloration to absorb more melanin. And uh, they use that darker coloration of more melanin to absorb the sun and the heat and things like that. They are, again, very similar to a lot of the other king snake species and milk snake species, because that's what we're talking about. Um, they are generalists, they will eat anything. They are known cannibals, so they will predate each other. They don't really seem to have one specific uh, prey source that's a little bit more favorite. They will eat everything in general. Really the only difference when it comes to the Andean milk snake versus most of the other ones is they actually do better and seem to prefer cooler temperatures. So one of these days, and I actually met a really cool breeder who breeds these guys last year that I might want to pick up a pair from, they'll actually probably be living in my cooler weather Asian rat snake gecko room that will probably eventually become mostly Asian rat snakes and other cooler weather animals. Um, they'll be going over there because they do better with a cooler temper zone and a much cooler hot spot to where essentially it'll just be kept over there in ambient temperatures in the winter, a tiny little warm underbelly heater and just a basking light for heat. Great, great species of snake, very large species of colubrid. They're really, really cool. Hopefully one day I'll get a pair of them on my own. And if anyone has a chance to go out and find an, a, any Andean milk snake, I absolutely recommend that you jump on the chance to get them. They're not overly priced, but they are still a really cool species of snake that you don't see too often. And I like the oddball stuff. Next on the list is the first of the two that are a little bit more controversial as far as the good pet reptile goes. So hear me out. The Amazon tree boa. So, and I know when we very first think about the arboreal snakes, we think of really bitey, very reactive, super defensive, not super handleable. Well, hear me out as we go along. So Amazon tree boas are found in northern and central parts of South America, east of the Andy mountain range. So they are found in that Amazon basin a little bit further north. They are highly, highly variable, almost purely arboreal, and actually are much longer and larger than a lot of people think. An adult Amazon tree boa can exceed lengths of over six feet long. Usually five is a little bit more typical of both males and females for their max length, but they can reach over six feet. We just don't see that because they're usually curled up on a tree branch or in like a little cave that we have raised up a little bit. So as I said before, they're very variable. A lot of the times they are born smaller. They do go through a small little change, but not again, not nearly as gen dramatic as say the green tree pythons or the emerald tree boas that some of the emerald tree boas do share their range. When they are born, they're usually a little bit darker, a little bit more drab, and as they get older, 
historically, when we think about the Amazon tree boas, at least until recently, they kind of fit into two categories, which are the garden phase and then the high contrast phase. So the garden phase, they're a little bit more darker, more drab. They blend in a little bit more with like tree bark, the browns, the grays, the whites, the blacks. And then the high contrast ones are the ones that are much more bright yellow, orange, and red, even with little bits of like green and things. But as with a lot of animals that we keep now, long periods of captive breeding, selectively breeding for color, for temperament, and for things like that, we now have an animal that looks almost nothing like a wild Amazon tree boa. Well, yes, it still shares the same physicalities and same body structure. Their temperament as a whole is much different, and now their color variation is insanely dynamic. We're talking about ones that are now, we have calicos and tiger stripes, ones that are born bright, like neon, like Ferrari apple red. There's the calicos that have high amounts of white splatters throughout there. The tiger stripes that can get mixed in with high oranges and high yellows and all of these crazy colors, as well as one that's been around for a long time that still kind of fits into the garden phase. And that's the Halloween phase where it's that really kind of more the drabby, dark, chocolatey color with crazy high oranges and yellows and even a little bit of red across their dorsal pattern to make that black and orange Halloween motif, right? Really, really cool animal. One of these days, I do plan on getting an Amazon tree, but I don't know if it's going to be one of like the crazy calico tiger, blood red, high red, yellow fire starburst things. And I know they don't actually have that. I'm sorry. I'm just trying to, I'm really trying to paint the picture. These guys are really beautiful animals, but captive born animals have over periods of time, never to the level of domesticity that we have with say like a cat or a dog, they are much more tolerant to human presence and human interactions than a lot of the ones in in the past. We've seen it all the time with reticulated pythons, even with emerald tree boas and green tree pythons as well. And we now see with the Amazon tree boas. I personally think that these might be one of the better beginner or getting into our boreal species of snakes because they are a little bit larger, a little bit hardier than some of the other, although emerald tree boas are larger in fact, but they're a little bit hardier and a little bit more forgiving when it comes to your husbandry needs because a lot of people have a hard time with arboreal snakes getting that good temperature and humidity gradient with a much taller vertical styled enclosure. I think they're really cool and they can be very handleable. We've seen it dozens of times on pictures of Instagram and YouTube and I'm, we all know that they do hide all of the bites and taking off gloves once the animal's out and things like that, but they can be much more habituated and much more receptive to human interactions and constant interactions that they have, as well as some other species of snakes that we are usually used to. As per usual, the last one on the list is going to be the most controversial, but hear me out again, as usual, I have reasons for my pick. So this one is one out of this whole list of animals and out of most of the animals that I've talked about in this whole series is the one that I am least likely to get. And that is because legally I'm not allowed to have it here in the state of Colorado. And that is the Musarana. The Musarana is actually one snake that has several different subspecies, six to be exact. There is one extinct one that we talked about in my video about the recent extinct reptiles. I'll try to put a link to this right here, but it is a very large, heavy bodied rear fanged venomous colubrid. They are found in from southern, southern Central America all the way down into the northern part of, set of South America. These guys are an amazing species of snake. So these guys share a lot of commonality and attributes and similarities to another species of snake that I do enjoy, and that is the Cribo and the Drymarcon genus. And in fact, on one of the Caribbean island subspecies, it is often miscalled and mislabeled a Cribo. And that is because they are long, they are heavy bodied, they are diurnal, they are active, they are intelligent, and they are known and often eating snakes. They are snake eaters, not necessarily cannibalistic as say like a woma python or something similar to that, but they do eat snakes as a main staple of their diet. These guys are big, big, big. If I haven't impressed that on you quite yet, they average five to six feet, but with regularity, especially with some of the main the mainland on South America subspecies and specifically the Musarana that it gets its name is often found at lengths over eight feet long. This is huge. We're talking, think like false water cobra that are found also in South America, those very long, heavy bodied colubrids. They have a natural immunity to Bothrops venom. And if you don't know that Bothrops is the species that the lance head viper belongs to. 
that is one of their main prey sources is the lancehead viper. And in fact, they, in several different populations and farming in rural, rural communities, they try to harvest a bunch of musaranas and then reproduce them and breed them en masse and essentially use them as like a natural snake deterrent. It didn't really work out. Uh, they didn't necessarily reproduce as well as they wanted to, and they mostly just kind of took off and avoided people as they could. Whereas the Bothrops and the Lanceheads are a little bit more accustomed because they will sit and stand their ground to people, the Musaranas would just leave to avoid human confrontation. So that didn't really work out very well. That being said, in captivity, they do make great pets. When they're born with a lot of the common theme of this today's video, they do go through an autogenic change. They're kind of a pinkish, light, creamy color when they're born, when they first hatch out. And then as they get older, they turn to that very dark, blue, black, like indigo snake looking colored animal. They are, as I said before, rear fang venomous, but out of every single person that I've ever talked to that has worked with, bred, handled rear fang venomous snakes, the musarana is, seems to be the animal that is least likely to actually have any sort of reactionary or defensive bite at all, which is great because it's a really big snake, even more so than a hog nose, even more so than the false water cobra, as I mentioned earlier. Really, really cool species of snake, but it is very large. So if you are someone that is in an area where you're allowed to have rear fang venomous animals, it's not truly, it's not going to cause a medically significant or a hospitalization, but it is a pretty big snake. So it's going to grab a hold of you, which I think everywhere that I could find, I found two documented cases of a bite from a musarana on a person. Both of those were someone that was trying to field collect them and neither of them had any reaction other than uh, slight irritation, redness, and uh, hives on the bite. And then it was a little achy for a day, I think is what the most that I ever found. But great, great pet animal, but larger enclosures, you need to keep them very similar to that as you would a Kribo or a Trimarkon. So very big, places for them to climb. They are diurnal, so give them full spectrum lighting. You'll see them move around a lot. And because they are generalists, they will eat rodents, they will eat birds, and they will eat snakes. So technically, you could almost have like a poor man's not scary King Cobra, where it's a very active, very reactive, very intelligent animal that you could in fact feed snakes and other lizards like you would do with king cobras. Only you don't have to worry about having to live in a place or getting all of the extra steps needed to get a venomous animal. You could have a musarana that would still be a very large snake that eats other snakes. It's a really, really cool animal. I really wish I could have one, but again, I can't have them here. So and any possible chance I have to go visit some of my other friends who do in fact work with them, uh, be on the lookout because I'm gonna. Hopefully you guys did enjoy this video. This really wraps it up for my, you know, reptile pets around the world series. It seems like you guys really like that. And whoever it was that suggested that down in the comments, put your name down so I can, you know, give you a shout out. This was a really great idea. I had so much fun researching and learning about all these different species that either I didn't think about, that I didn't work with, or I didn't know too much about, and then being able to share it with all of you. If you guys have any other suggestions for other series or other video ideas, please let me know down in the comments. I tried to do a couple that were just different reptiles from the different continents and countries that I thought was really cool, but it didn't seem to quite go over quite as well. If you guys want to let me continue to do that where, you know, for Australia, I talked about different reptiles that don't necessarily make the best pets but are just really cool species of reptiles that I could talk about a little bit more. If you'd like to see that series, let me know down in the comments and I'll continue with that. Or again, if you have ideas for anything else, please let me know. For species spotlights and things like that, I am going to go through as many of the animals that I personally have because I know a little bit more about them. And then I'm gonna get into some of the suggestions that everyone has made for me to get to the other different species that I personally don't work with. So I have taken them down. They are in my little snake notebook that I keep all, all of my notes in. So I will have that down below. But again, if you have any other ideas, please let me know. Hopefully you enjoyed this. If you do really like me sharing this content with you, please, if you can, consider checking out my Patreon. I have different levels of different you know, payment amounts you can add. And I do have various reward memberships, including, you know, little things like this, the little wristbands for the podcast, stickers, t-shirts, tours, and then eventually I might even have in-person things going on here. We're not quite to that level yet, but if you do like this and like what I do, this does take quite a bit of time. It's hours of just researching and scripting and then filming, let alone editing that my partner has to do. 
which is even more add on to this. It takes a good chunk of our day. So if you do consider, you know, help, if you do feel like wanting to support me, I would greatly appreciate it. If not, just watching these videos and having the really cool interactions with this little community that we're starting to build is amazing. I love it. I'm, I'm, I would like to get to the point where I, this is all I do is just share my love and passion of animals with everyone. But in the meantime, I am going to can still, I'm going to continue to still do this. I'm going to continue to share my love, share my passion, research new things and share that with everyone else. So thank you so much for everyone that has followed me along this long on my journey, everyone that's just jumping on board now. And just thank you again so much. I hope everyone's having an amazing day. Hope to hear from everyone very soon. Hope you guys are enjoying the reptile content and we'll check you next time.